Okay, so um, next session is issues of post-settlement support and what I'm going to call agrarian reform. Okay, so 10 minutes and then 20 minutes discussion. For rural land reform to succeed in improving income and livelihoods, you need resources other than land. Land by itself is not sufficient. Clearly, talking about rural land, if we're talking about urban land, slightly different, but we can frame it as it's not enough to get a house or a plot on which to build a shack. You also need access to livelihood opportunities, to economic opportunities. So where that land is located is critically important. So it's not land in and of itself. Yes, it has these larger spiritual meanings, but those are always underpinned by material factors. They actually intermeshed with livelihoods and economic activity. So the real question with rural land reform is, are we doing enough? Once people get back land through restitution or get access to new land through a redistribution project, are they provided with the wherewithal to make that land productive to improve their livelihoods? So what do people need? You need inputs, for which you need cash. You need seed, fertilizer and chemicals. Hopefully you will get some water because we're such a dry country you, for, irrig for irrigation purposes. You need farm tools and machinery, you need farm infrastructure, you need buildings, roads and fencing, you need transport, you need a vehicle, uh, you need access to markets, you might in some instances need access to finances. You also need skills and technical knowledge. And in rural South Africa you cannot assume that because a person has a rural background that they necessarily have the skills to operate a farm, and, and in particular a large-scale commercial farm. So post-settlement support is absolutely key to making this a success. Another way to frame this question is not simply in terms of post-settlement support and support services and so on, but it's to frame the question, well, if you're changing the distribution of a productive resource, are you not potentially restructuring the agricultural sector? If you're doing it on a large scale, if we were to redistribute, say, 50% of commercial farmland, this would surely make a big difference to the structure of the sector. Particularly if you're going to break up large farms into smaller farms. Okay, so the larger issue is one of what we call agrarian structure. That is, it's a pattern of land holding, but also of production and marketing. It in fact implies a particular class structure, set of class relations. Potentially land re and you know, across the world, if we look at the history of land reform internationally, often land reforms are actually called agrarian reform because the purpose of changing land ownership is to restructure an entire sector. Some of the most successful uh, agrarian reforms in history have been in places like Taiwan and Korea, the so-called newly industrialized countries, Japan, where they were critical to industrialization. So potentially, changing the relationships in the agricultural sector can make massive differences to poverty, inequality, and the prospects for economic growth. So there are these larger rationales, uh, hence, the, hence the, the heading agrarian reform. But now, if, we were going to, if that's what we're intending to do, to not just support a few black people and little bits of pieces of land, but to do something about the structure of the agricultural sector, we have to think carefully about what our vision of an alternative structure is. And we need to think carefully about which land and which productive enterprises we're transferring to which people, the who question once again. So there's more than at, at stake here than simply land. And we also have to think not only about the food system in the country and issues of food security, we also have to think about export earnings because although South African agriculture contributes only about 2% or perhaps slightly more to GDP, it contributes a lot more to export earnings, about 10%. And it contributes uh, quite significantly to employment as well. So there's a lot at stake here. So that's uh, by way of introducing the question. Uh, just to say, um, look, you know, we have many problems in South Africa, and the structure of the economy is clearly a major one. It's highly concentrated, every single sector. We also have massive unemployment, 37% unemployment. We can get growth in the core, we're doing nothing about poverty and inequality. We have to address the structure of the economy more generally. Perhaps land reform in its attempt to redistribute economic opportunities offers a model 
for economic policy more widely? I'll leave that as a question. So, uh, so let's look at a little bit of history, drawing on our earlier slideshow. We had a productive African peasant farming sector in the early, late 19th and early 20th centuries. It supplied the diamond mines when they opened up, the gold mines. It was systematically destroyed by, uh, by previous white governments. African reserves, as we saw in the, in, the, in the exhibition, became reservoirs of poorly paid migrant workers offering cheap labor to the mines and industry, as well as to commercial <coughs> agriculture. And with forced removals, they became densely populated to the extent that many people don't have access to land and cannot support themselves from agriculture. And in contrast, white commercial farming was heavily subsidized for many decades, from 1910 onwards, through a variety of uh, forms of support, including through land acquisition, uh, subsidizing acquisition of farms through loans, through price support, and in, uh, a whole institutional architecture of marketing boards, and a lot of it was for conservation infrastructure on farms. Black farmers had the opposite. They were, they were uh, systematically destroyed. So in 1994, we have 82 million hectares of commercial farmland owned by about 60,000 white farmers. And in black farmers squeezed into the the reserves, initially 7%, later 13%, we have a very large number of households, many of whom are no longer able to farm, who are dependent on remittances from migrant workers. Some smallholder agriculture does survive in the communal areas, and it was there in 1994, but we had this very divided, dualist agrarian structure. A relatively small number of large, capital-intensive, sophisticated farms developed through year, decades of subsidy on the one hand, and the other hand, a very large number of very small-scale sub or sub subsubsistence uh, households on the other, and a very small number of black farmers in the middle, operating on a slightly larger scale. And the key issue for land reform is, what is the intent with regards to the structure? Are we going to change it or not? Of course, you also have three million farm workers, some of the poorest and most depressed people in the country, on farms as well. well what did government say in 1994? What did the RDP, the Reconstruction and Development Program, have to say? What did the White Paper of 1997 have to say? The RDP said that land reform will be the central and driving force of rural development, aiming to build the economy by generating large-scale employment, actually increasing employment, thus increasing rural incomes. It said it would promote the productive use of land, include the provision of services, and it would aim to create a restructured agricultural sector that spreads the ownership base, encourages small-scale agriculture, further, further develops the commercial sector, and increases production and employment. The White Paper talked about a rural landscape consisting of small, medium, and large farms promoting both equity and efficiency. So there were some statements about what the intent was with regard to agrarian reform. Since those early 1994 statements, there's been very little elaboration of policy in this regard. The agricultural sector has gone its own way, particularly under Tabo and Becky, where there was a, a consultative group that was basically aimed at protecting agriculture and promoting a few, few large-scale black commercial farmers. Land reform policy has gone in its own direction. They're very rarely connected with one another. The key problem in land reform is lack of coordination within government. And the same goes for water allocation. Water allocation reform is preceded without touching sides with land reform, one of the key failures of government since 1994. So what has been the outcome of this lack of policy making? Firstly, within land reform, despite the so-called commitment to encouraging small-scale agriculture, even in the Mandela period, in fact, this continued to be an implicit bias towards models of large-scale commercial agriculture in planning and transfer of land. So of the farms acquired by government for restitution and re redistribution, not one single of those farms, not one, has been subdivided into smaller farms, smaller farming units, despite the fact that law allows them 
to do so without uh, asking for permission. This demonstrates very clearly that what beneficiaries of land reform have been asked to do is take over existing large-scale enterprises and operate them as though only the racial own, uh, ownership has, has altered and nothing else. But without the massive levels of support which were provided to such farmers in the past. So it's setting people up for failure. In the case of um, large groups of people, 100, 200, 300,000 coming together in large claims or in redistribution projects, they've been asked to operate these farms as collectives. 100 people running a commercial farm, a recipe for failure as well. So the, the notion is viability. What is a viable project? The criteria for viability have been drawn from the large-scale sector, and they're often completely inappropriate for the small-scale farming sector. Who's drawn up the business plans? Government has outsourced this to consultants, mostly failed white farmers. Uh, one study in the Northwest found that there was an inverse relationship between success and the business plan. In other words, you're more likely to be successful the less attention you pay to your business plan. <laughs> the particular uh, programs of support that government has put in place since about the mid-2000s, the Comprehensive Agricultural Support Program, now transferred back to agriculture, and then later on the RECAP program, these have not been effective. Partly because there's been this increasing bias towards smaller numbers of middle class beneficiaries, in, in particular in redistribution. They've been highly skewed, and uh, in some cases, very small numbers of people have had the lion's share of the money. So in 2009, 50% of the CASP money went to 2.8% of beneficiaries. Again, demonstrating a pattern of elite capture. And the Evaluation of the recapitalization program carried out by the Depart Department of Performance Monitoring and Evaluation in 2013 reveals a similar pattern. In free state, each beneficiary was getting a million rand. Unfortunately, the condition of getting recap funding is that you have a strategic partner and or a mentor, and often these people are benefiting more than the beneficiaries. So the attempt to provide a degree of post-settlement support through these mechanisms has not been very successful. What's happened in the agricultural sector in, the abs in, 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 in this context of policy failure? Well, subsidies were withdrawn from the white commercial farming sector, starting in the late 1980s, because the state could no longer afford them, and speeded up in the 1990s. So we get uh, new agricultural marketing acts which disband the marketing boards, price supports are removed, subsidies are removed, and as a result, some white farmers go out of business because they can't survive without the support. And the competitive ones have survived. And so what we see is, um, let me show this slide, is that farms, the number of farms is reducing, the one uh, graph, and the size of farms is increasing. Smaller numbers of larger farms. That's the pattern. This is a process of concentration, of continuing concentration, which of course happens in competitive economies, particularly pretty unregulated uh, economies. Concentration is the law of capital, isn't it? Uh, we've also seen uh, increased vertical integration within value chains. So some of the larger farmers are involved in producing inputs to sell to other farmers, as well as getting involved in processing, packaging, and retail, which, which of course uh, allows a lot of capture, uh, value of cap uh, capture of the value being produced. Of course, agribusiness up and downstream of farming itself has become even ever more concentrated. And with that comes an implicit bias towards the large-scale model. There's also been a shift away from extensive crops and livestock to more intensive, higher value horticultural crops in the sector. With regard, in respect of black agriculture, we've seen a few black commercial farmers emerging, partly with state support, partly through buying their own farms. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we've basically seen uh, a great deal of continuity. So, 
what are the spectrum of options and opinions going forward? So there's a range of views here, which perhaps you should aim to capture in your stories about these issues. On the one hand, there's a view held by AgriSA, by the AgBiz Chamber and many others, that only high, large-scale, high-tech, capital-intensive forms of farming are viable. But of course, the large-scale commercial farming sector must be deracialized. This is the Tabo and Becky view. So it's a view saying, just get real, guys. This is the name of the game, but of course it can't all be white dominated. A second view is that, no, yeah, that's not going to uh, really bring in a sufficient change. So what we need to do is promote strategic partnerships. Let's get the private sector involved. Let's get the private sector to enter into partnerships with land reform beneficiaries, of, particularly in those large-scale, high-value enterprises like uh, fruit and nuts, but also a range of other uh, products. And this is the view currently held in Treasury. Uh, it's a view promoted by the Vimalana Advisory Fund, which was set up by the Business Trust. And it's also the view of the Center for Development and Enterprise under Anne Bernstein, who published an article, I think, earlier this week, on Monday, I think, saying the private sector will come to the rescue. There's a third view, which is held by NGOs, by activists, and by international experts like Michael Lipton. And this is the view that the small-scale farmers, the, the evidence from around the world, from Africa, from Zimbabwe, and perhaps even from South Africa itself, is that small-scale producers can be not only labor-intensive in their productions, thus creating jobs, but can also be efficient. So the view is we need to break up the large-scale sector and transfer all that land to a, uh, to a large number of black smallholders. In other words, set back the clock. Personally, I think there are problems with all those views. I would reject all of them as trying a one-size-fits-all. I don't think one-size-fits-all. I think we can have a range of large, medium, small-scale and very small-scale producers. What we need to do is support them with policy. And I would suggest that we need to do this through a very careful targeting of both the farms that we acquire and of the beneficiaries that should benefit. And I do have some suggestions about how that would be structured, but we'll leave that uh, for question time. I would say that there are very important success stories to think about in land reform. As Ruth mentioned earlier, there's the bestest case in KwaZulu-Natal, the former labor tenants are producing beef and multi-purpose cattle very, very successfully and competitively. There's the Molotele claim in Hootspreit fruit farming. There's the Ravele case, as I said. There's Inkaseni and Tunjan in Msinga. There's the Amak in Kolosi in Kranskorp, a large sugar, timber and vegetable producing enterprise, a restitution claim. Also, failures. In the majority of cases are failures. I don't know if anyone saw the story in Huffington Post about three weeks ago on Cominage in Stellenbosch, a truly shocking story which could be followed up. The Zebedila Citrus, once the largest citrus estate in the southern hemisphere, going to rack and ruin through corruption. What is happening with the so-called agri-parks initiated by Mr. and Quinty? No one's ever done a story on this, not one single story. It's consuming a huge proportion of the, of the budget at the moment, and I think very, very badly conceived I expect it to fail utterly, as did the Comprehensive Rural Development Program, but society is not paying attention to it. Uh, and uh, I think I would agree with Ruth, the strategic partnerships, absolutely key. So uh, I think leave it at that and open up to questions. Okay. Great. And I know that uh, Ben is keeping one of his main arguments for question time, because what he's pointed to is, um, is the changing structure of agriculture. What we see here is an anti-land reform, right? What we see actually is the opposite of land reform. It's a, it's a concentration. It's an anti-agrarian reform. It's a concentration uh, of ownership and control over farmland and of agricultural capital that has actually accelerated in the era of democracy rather than being undone, right? So we have uh, a lot of discourse about small-scale farmers, about small is beautiful, but in fact what we're seeing is a failure to subdivide and the consolidation and concentration of ownership. So Ben, I think, wants to add on the question, the crucial question, which is 
if we want to change the agricultural sector, if we want to change landholding patterns, should we be targeting the top or the bottom or somewhere in the middle? So that's, uh, I know, what he would like to add on. No one's really looked at agri-parks. Um, I'm not even sure that there are any actually in operation yet, but we, two years ago we had uh, fancy PowerPoint presentations with brilliant new buildings and so on. Uh, my guess would be that there isn't a single one that's functioning. It's very unclear from the Agri-Parks Agri document who is targeted, what forms of production, located where, what form. So the idea is you provide support services and you also buy products. But none of the details are specified. Our officials in the department haven't got a clue about agriculture. That's one of the problems. So this is just actually another case for tenders, tenderpreneurs. With respect to spending, um, now Ruth actually has produced very powerful, interesting analyses of the budget for land reform, uh, which show the trends over time, which we don't have on PowerPoint right now. We can probably look them up and put we them can up email for you. People. We can you can certainly. But basically, this is another question. Yeah. The, the other question is about so um, what it what they what the budget analysis shows basically is that um, the amount of money spent on, for example, the National Youth <coughs> Scheme, the Youth Employment Scheme, uh, as it, as, uh, plus the spending on the Comprehensive Rural Development Program, a badly conceived and failing program, plus more recently spending on agri-parks, has increasingly taken money away from uh, money for buying land. So the actual amount of money for buying land is now, look, the overall budget for land reform has never been more than 0.4% of the national budget, indicating it's extremely low political priority. The budget for redistribution, which is basically a capital expenditure budget buying land, is now 0.1% of the national budget. So the, the pattern is of... Uh, similar patterns actually show up for, for restitution. So the actual business of trans acquiring and transferring land is of less importance, and these other, quite frankly, crackpot uh, schemes have increasingly assumed imp importance. With respect to subsidies, the, I, I don't actually have the figures, but uh, when dereg deregulation and liberalization was introduced, first in the 80s and then finalized in the mid-90s, the outcome of that, of that was that South African <coughs> agriculture was one of the least protected agricultures anywhere in the world, on a par with New Zealand. But compared to the massive levels of protection of agriculture in OECD countries, for example, it is now completely exposed to the winds of global competition. So we went from highly subsidized to one of the least subsidized agricultures in the world. And the whole idea of those who proposed this reform is that we would, we, would do, we, would, uh, we would do this in the name of efficiency. Okay? But what was also said was that to make this work for land reform, we need to develop a farmer support program. We need to make the post-settlement support services available to farmers. And that, unfortunately, has failed to materialize to any real extent. The success stories in land reform, few and far between as they are, reveal that, uh, in fact, small-scale farmers can be productive and efficient. Even when they use labor-intensive methods, the returns to their labor can be rewarding. So uh, in, play, in, in re, uh, former labor tenant farms now being farmed by beneficiaries, which I'm uh, in touch with or follow through research in Kaseni, Punjan, these uh, producers, both on irrigated land, producing fresh produce and of livestock, are very efficient. In the, in the bestest case, CPAs are operating commercial beef herds and selling uh, good, high quality animals in the local auction sales, and they also keep household based herds for a variety of purposes uh, in, very successfully. In, in, um, in the, the Ravelle case, uh, the Ravelli community is operating high-value commercial fruit and nut operations very successfully. There's no necessary correlation between small-scale and lack of success. I think in all these cases, uh, capitalization and support have been key.
You have to have the capital available at a variety of scales. Uh, so I think the, the scare about food security, the narrative that if we transfer land to small-scale black farmers, uh, is is a, is a, you know it's a it's turning up the scary music. It's basically an attempt to say we have to preserve the status quo. Mm. And I think the evidence I would argue from Zimbabwe is that if you break up large farms and give them to smaller scale A1 farmers, those farmers can be highly productive. Of course, they haven't been supported enough because the economy of the country as a whole is in in a dire way, and and capital is a problem. But where under contract farming arrangements, small-scale farmers get access to seeds and inputs uh, through a processing company and then re repay back that money when the product is marketed, as has happened in cotton and tobacco, then those small-scale farmers have proved to be highly productive. So I think there's a certain myth around large-scale agriculture. Of course, in some crops, in some uh, sectors of the agricultural economy, large-scale does make sense. But uh, I think this idea that you, know, you necessarily always have economies of scale is a myth. It's true in some sectors, plantation crops, for example, but not in other crops. And I would say that small-scale farmers in South Africa have the competitive advantage, firstly, in fresh produce, where they have irrigation water, as shown in the Tegela Ferry Irrigation Scheme, uh, where I do research, where 800 farmers produce 20 million rands of fresh produce every year for the informal market. Uh, and also in livestock production, uh, which is a completely underestimated sector. And remember that South Africa is a dry country. <coughs> Half of our land is less than 400 millimetres of rainfall. Only 28% is more than 600 mil millimetres of rainfall. Most of our country is suitable for livestock production. And black livestock farmers often outcompete white commercial farmers. So I, I think this whole story about food security is way overdone. Uh, with regard to... Uh, the split between agriculture and land reform. Um, look, you know, we, we had a situation, I think it was under Togo Dodiza, where you had one minister uh, and two departments under her. She was the Minister of Land Affairs, but also Minister of Agriculture. That didn't necessarily mean that those two departments worked closely together. Remember that agriculture in our constitution is deemed a provincial competency and land is a national competency. So provincial departments of agriculture often do their own thing. For the first 15 years of land reform, they were deeply skeptical and provided almost zero support. Now they're supposed to be providing support, but they develop their own policies. Whereas land is a national competency. That's, it's actually a serious issue. I think consideration should be given to forming a new department, a new department of agrarian reform, which brings together the land transfer components of land affairs and the agrarian reform components of agriculture, uh, and we create a, a new department with capacity, uh, the, the capacity required to undertake these complex tasks. Uh, and I think we need to think and plan and implement in a much more coordinated fashion. Of course, that's a problem in general for government. Two points. Um, we're going to have to stop in a moment because we have a, a tea and coffee break. Uh, Firstly, I wanted to answer a question and then ask one to Ben. Um, in relation to the question of, well, what's happened with budgets for agricultural support? Yeah, well, in fact, if we... The declaration, 15% yeah. So what has happened over the past 15 years is there has actually been an increase in budget allocations for agricultural support. So if you look at... Um, and I can email you um, some, of the, some of the data, some of the graphs. Um, uh, what we see is an increase in actual budget allocation and also budget allocation per black farming household. But what we see is a very, very, very unequal distribution of that, well, uh, of that, of that budget. So we're seeing, you know, 0.1% of black farming households get access to grants or loans. This kind of problem. Um, I've worked on this with uh, Michael Alaba, who's at the University of Fort Hare. He has a lot of data. If you want to look into, like, government is budgeting more but spending very badly. Who's getting this? Who's not getting? Why? Uh, there's a lot of information out there. Last question to Ben, and then we're going to go for uh, coffee. And my question is, Ben, I know that you have a proposal, which is this big question. If we really wanted to change the agrarian structure, should we 
focus on the most marginal white commercial farmers, or should we go for the big, um, the big corporate agriculture? Where should we focus? So Ben, tell us in Thank one minute. Right. Yeah. Okay. This is a diagram drawn from the 2002 agricultural census, which shows that the top 5,000 farms in 2002 were producing 62% of all agricultural value. Since then, concentration has increased. We now have, instead of 42,000 farmers, we probably have around 30,000 commercial farmers. And I would estimate that the top 20%, 5,000, 7,000 farms, produce 80% of all value. This creates a massive opportunity, of course. It means we can redistribute 80% of farms with very little threat to food security. We've, white farming is not homogenous. White farming is highly differentiated. In many sectors, there are one or two or three or four or five or six very large producers. These are the ones who are competing successfully. There's a large number of medium and slightly smaller scale farmers who are quite marginal. Some of them are in the dry areas, some of them are on marginal land. Quite a few of them are efficient in their own way, but they lack the resource base to really uh, contribute all that much. So what does this mean for policy? Who should be, if we were to redistribute the land of 80% of farmers, who should get that land? Key question, right? So, this is a, a diagram of the structure of small-scale black agriculture. According to stats to say, there are about 2.5 million households produce some form of agricultural produce. 90% of them produce that for, as, a little, as, as a source of extra food on, from ho homestead gardens and small flocks of livestock. 10%, about 250,000, are market-oriented. They produce for cash. They produce those as the form of livestock, also uh, fresh produce, so there's irrigation, and a small amount of other crops, uh, maize and fruit and so on. There are very small numbers of smallholders supplying supermarkets in tight value chains. Very difficult to do. It's not really something that is feasible in the short run for very many people as proven by the, the, the Walmart experience through MassMart. They aim to secure supplies from 1,200 smallholder farmers in terms of their agreement with government, only ever succeeded in uh, creating uh, supply chains from 130 instead of 1,500. Very difficult to do. And there's a small number of small-scale black capitalist farmers, maybe 5,000, we don't really know. A FASA, the African Farmers Association of South Africa, has four to 5,000 members. So. Um, you know, the idea that we're going to de-racialize the commercial sector by getting black farmers into this very competitive sector, it's worth trying, but it's not really going to change things very, very much at all. So the question is, for, of these groups of existing farmers with agricultural experience, who do you think should get the land of the 80% of farmers which we could redistribute without really endangering food security? So here's my proposal, uh, provocative and controversial. Mm -hmm. I think we should redistribute 80% uh, of farms, 50 million hectares, to 200,000 market-oriented smallholders. We already produce successfully in livestock and fresh produce with irrigation water. By the way, they mostly sell to the informal market, which is largely ignored by policy and in statistics. It's much bigger than we imagine. In Tagela Ferry, farmers sell to bucky traders who distribute some of the earliest green millies in the province to towns around the province. Surprising, but uh, a, a little known fact. Mm. With respect to field crops like maize, I don't think it's possible to compete with large scale. The economies of scale, the mechanization means it's really not worth small farmers' while. That's why there's so much uncultivated arable land in the former homelands, and it's why it's under, under grazing livestock at the moment. Makes sense. Of course, um, the problem with this proposal is that you, you would leave the top 20% alone. And these are the big fat, the real fat cats, right? The ones who've succeeded. Is that a price too heavy to pay? Well, you can m m modify the argument slightly. Let's put pressure on them to assist with agrarian reform. Let's say to them, uh, provide uh, access to markets, to capital, to skills, and donate some of their vast holdings. Some of them hold, hold you know, <coughs> way over 20,000 hectares. And actually some of them are prepared to donate land. So you can bring pressure to bear as a condition of support is that they make the wider agrarian reform work. So, and I would leave them alone for two decades uh, while 
a new black farming class comes to the fore, and then we'll see. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Ben, for being provocative, uh, as usual. Um, what we're going to do now is take a break. After the break, we're going to talk about the enormously complex issue around communal tenure, customary uh, tenure, uh, and traditional authorities, including Ngunyama Trust. Um, then uh, we will be dealing also with farm workers and dwellers. We'll be dealing with urban land questions, and then we'll, come to, we'll bring our focus back to the Constitution and to the current debate around expropriation without compensation. So let's go to coffee. Thanks. Cheers.